the amount of people in my career who have said to me, oh, you're so underrated. You know, like, I, I once had an agent say to me, you're one of the most underrated actors. And it makes me so mad. You're one of the most underrated actors in Hollywood. And I was like, well, dude, do something <laughs> right, about right. it. This is Really Famous. I'm Kara Mayer Robinson, and I interview famous people. But I don't just interview them like your typical interview. I'm not really interested in those same old questions. Instead, I like to know who they really are and what they really think. Sometimes it's like listening to old friends catching up, and other times it's like eavesdropping on a therapy session. Today, I'm sitting down with Tony Goldwyn. So if you watch Scandal, you know Tony plays Fitz or President Fitzgerald Grant. If you don't watch Scandal, you probably know that anyway. Or you may remember him going way back to the movie Ghost. He played Patrick Swayze's best friend and not such a great guy as it turned out. And he's been in so many things since then. But he's not just an actor, he's also a director. And we talk about a lot of the shows that he's worked on. Tony has a serious family lineage. Yes, his last name is Goldwyn, and his grandfather was Samuel Goldwyn, who was like one of the original film producers, and he's the G in MGM. Tony's other grandparents and his parents and siblings are also in the entertainment industry, and we will talk about that. Plus, he dabbles in plenty of other things. For example, he has published a few articles in magazines like More and in style. Now, about this conversation, Tony shares lots of anecdotes and we get to go off on tangents of all kinds, which is my kind of conversation. He really got into the groove, but I have to say, I feel like I only scratched the surface with him. He's a thoughtful person, he has a fascinating history, and he has like analyzed life and what has happened to him, and he has a really genuine humility, and I appreciate all that. I feel like I'm going to need a second episode at some point. But in the meantime, we have this one. Media company that you used to write for or not? It is produced by me. Or you. you did, it's your, totally your thing. Me and my interns. Which is awesome because then you own it too. I own it. Yeah. I own it, which is nice. No, but it is the, nice, But yeah. the problem with that is there's a lot of business stuff right. that gets in the way. For me, I would rather just do this. Right. But you have to do all the housekeeping. Yeah. Yeah. So... Maybe one day there will be somebody else owning right. it and producing it. Right. But right now, it's my independent yeah. podcast. So I do with it whatever I want. Right. Which is nice. Yeah. But you are a writer. Mm, well, I write. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a professional writer. I write articles I've written for magazines and newspapers and stuff. I know. Um, and I've done a, I guess by now I've done a lot of public speaking. So I write whatever I say uh, but I'm not a screenwriter or play you know playwright I don't, don't write dramatic writing but just because you're not a dramatic <clears throat> writer doesn't mean you're not a writer that's true mm -hmm. if you write things you're a writer if you put words down on paper you're a writer <laughs> most people would say <laughs> if you get words on paper and then actually they get published yeah. in magazines well, that's true so I'm a writer it just feels a little I, I know I, I, I can maybe I've always been this way it took me for a while to call myself a director until I'd actually finished directing a feature film and it was actually in the theaters, I was like, oh, I guess I can call myself a director. Even though I'd, by the time it came out, I'd been directing for a couple of years because it right. took that to get it made. So I, I'm careful, of, I don't know. Uh, You're uh, humble. I guess that's it, I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of bullshit in uh, m our business and a lot of people who take up space with a you know, with a with a a, a pitch, with an idea. You know what I mean? With a, a line of bullshit. Yeah. So, so like, so I always try and make sure if I'm gonna if I'm putting something out there that it actually can back it up. Okay. Because I'm sort of allergic to that tendency to over promote oneself with hyperbole. Maybe because right. I'm terrified of being <laughs> called out. <laughs> Maybe, but the, so that's an interest. Well, that's just your personality, obviously. But yeah, and I just experienced a lot in my career. Uh, people who lie 
honestly, I don't mean I don't mean to start off this conversation in a yeah. jaded way because I'm not particularly jaded. Uh, but but um, I, uh, I I I, I, I um, it also used to, it used to really bother me um, when people would just over promote themselves and um, and then I've actually been in business with a lot of people who say things that are not exactly true. So I always err on the side of humility because I think that that'll make, you come off looking better in the end. Well, that's true. <laughs> but I think that bothers me too. I don't, but it's <clears throat> funny because you got right into one of my personal, like the things that I really dislike when I see it is mm -hmm. lies. Like I really, if somebody, if I could label them a liar or whatever, to me, that's one of the worst things you can be. I don't know if it really is one of the worst things somebody can be. I'm mm -hmm. sure there are worse things. But to me, it's one of those things that is very offensive to me. And I really, like balk at it or like uh, yeah, no, turns me off big time. I completely agree. I, you know, it's funny. I was thinking about this literally the other night because uh, our show network deals with this uh, and, uh, you know, what's happening in our media culture and, and um, uh, you know, it, it, Brian Cranston's character, Howard Beale, talks about, you know, people should just get angry I'm, you know, I suspect we'll talk more about this in a minute. But, we will. but uh, you know, he's like, just get angry and then we'll decide what to do with it. But just get angry first, which is kind of where our politics have gone. And I was thinking, well, what actually makes me really mad? Because I have a pretty low, I have a pretty sort of high threshold, I guess, for, for losing my shit. <laughs> and uh, lying is one of them. When people lie to me, it just makes me crazy. And and not that I've not been guilty of it in the past. Can I tell you a really stupid yeah, yeah, anecdote yeah. of one of the things that put put me off lying at a relatively early age? Um, even, not that I've been a, a saint since then, but but um, I used to as an young as an adolescent, young adolescent, like mm, 10, 11, 12, sort of pubescent years. I. Uh, I had a very active fantasy life and also was going through a time of great sort of social insecurity going into like middle school and not knowing how to navigate that. So I started to make up elaborate stories about myself for social acceptance. I mean, crazy elaborate stories about myself, about uh, just different stuff that I would that I was into, and the story started to intersect and interweave, and I had a whole kind of persona and and story. Wait, I'm gonna need that some was specifics. completely not true. Okay, but well, um, one of them. So it started out with uh, you know I, I transitioned into seventh grade from going to like a small school in Los Angeles, a private school, and I wanted to go to public school, so I went from a having the same 20 people in my class from the time I was six to a school of 1,500 kids. So I had like, you know, whatever, 800 kids in my, you know, I thought, whatever, six, 700 kids in my grade. And I didn't know anybody. So I didn't know how to make friends. And it was ter it was it was very disorienting. And um, so when I talk to people, I talk about my girlfriend. Like I, I was 12, right? <laughs> so I talk about my girlfriend. Let me guess, was she from Canada? No, no, usually people, I feel like Canada, kids that age 12. make up. No, I wasn't, no, I wasn't not that, that well traveled. <laughs> not that way, but I think that at that age, the popular story is, I have a girlfriend. She lives in Canada. That's oh, why see, you never right, see exactly. her. Well, maybe I said she lived in, uh, in the valley. I don't right, know. right, right. Her, her okay, so you had a girlfriend. Her geographical location actually never came up, as I recall, but her name was Lisa, as I recall. And, um, and I filled it in completely, her whole, who she was. It, it's sort of pathetic. Uh, or I, I, I literally created this whole character, and I'll talk about her. I also um, was a uh, <laughs> semi-professional ski racer. Uh, yes, I was on the uh, junior national uh, <laughs> ski team, uh, specializing in giant slalom <laughs> at 12 years old. Well, that's impressive. And, uh, you know, and I, I liked to ski, but I was not. Um, uh, I was not a racer. Uh, anyway, um, that was another thing. Things like that. What else? Um, honestly, I can't, those were the two main. Uh, but the good things. thing is, I think I said that I would like. I was before I even thought about being an actor. But I think I said I acted in television commercials, um, and I was quite specific about the kinds of commercials that I had been in. Uh, 
And so I, I created this whole persona that I thought would make me appear kind of fabulous. And people believed it, and they were like, wow, that's so cool. Um, and, and it went on for a, over a year. <clears throat> and um, I was at a, like, a summer camp. My father got it in his head to send me to this <laughs> survivalist camp in Wyoming where it was run by these drunken cowboys. And they take young boys, and they'd make you... Uh, they get you up at five o'clock in the morning and send you out into the woods to work with chainsaws, I recall. I don't know why, you know, 12, 13 year old boys were given chainsaws with no training, but we were cutting down trees and chopping up lumber and stuff like that. That actually sounds like a good <laughs> idea. Like, you're going to work before you have <laughs> breakfast. That was the thing. And then they taught you survival skills. And uh, at the end of it, you spent a week in the wilderness with no food and you'd been taught supposedly all these skills of how to survive and you were in a group of like six or seven boys uh, and you were given a gun, a rifle and every boy had a bullet and a hunting knife and no food. And so we were supposed to like team up. Now they gave us so live firearms with no really no training. <laughs> with, with one kids, bullet. With one bullet each. So each kid could try to kill something and they wouldn't and you'd share it or deal with it or whatever. Right. Um, so basically, we didn't eat for a week. Anyways, but the, but we all came quite close. It was torture, and, and the guys probably sat drinking whiskey and laughing at us and collecting whatever cash. Uh, cash they were paid for the tuition of this camp. But anyway, so my point is, <laughs> this group of guys, I had through with them told them all of my wild stories. Uh, and at the end of this thing, when we got back, they all sat me down, and they were like, we need to talk to you. I said, what? And they said, we know everything you've said is bullshit. I said, what, what are we talking about? They go, you know, you said this, this doesn't add up to that, and we know you're lying. And you're not a ski racer because so-and-so is on the junior national team, and he's never heard of you in the places you get. Like, they, they called me out on all of my it. stuff. They Your just story. knew, and they, conf they did like an intervention. And it was super intense. And I remember like crying, and they, they, were, they said, why do you do, like, you're a good dude. Why are you doing this? You don't have to do this. We like you. Why do you make up this elaborate thing, man? And, and um. And it was so confronting to me that I, it kind of cured me of of, um, of the impulse to, uh, you know, to gild the lily or exaggerate my own importance or do anything. It was it was very intense, uh, and uh, but it was it was an incredible gift that these guys totally. gave me. Really, like they, they was done in a kind of lovingly, and for thirteen year olds, the fact that they didn't just renounce me was. Right amazing to me i couldn't believe th that they were so incredibly kind and mature in their uh the, the way that they laid it out for me so anyway that's a neither here nor their story no, but, but is, isn't that crazy yeah that is crazy but also it's interesting because first of all it happened at such a young age and the fact that they didn't renounce you and they weren't like oh this kid and they just kind of threw you out to the street or something that's really amazing it was amazing um, and so that probably also made you more confident in who you really are, I would think. Well, I guess I, what I realized I had to start from scratch. And uh, if I was going to be talking about something, it would be so much better if it was real. So I needed to start to build from there. Uh huh. As opposed to a lot of people have an impulse. They feel they need to be to appear more fabulous than they are because the way they are is not enough. And I was like, well, what about if you just like do it? <laughs> and right. You can say, here's what I'm doing. Yeah, and you don't even have to say and it because like, you oh feel it. Oh my God, it. that's awesome. Yeah. Or that doesn't interest me. But at least it's, you don't have to, it's also less exhausting. Yeah. Like, and so I, I kind of have, I can smell it when someone's doing that and I immediately am turned off. So you're lucky that you took care of that then because in this business especially now that would be basically what you were doing what you'd be doing or like feel like you have to do if you didn't get it out of your system well and in hollywood and in showbiz in general you know there were people who have whole careers doing that like frankly. smoke and mirrors almost yeah and you know people get very far and then they all they inevitably crash because it, it, you can only be a con man or a woman to a point before people start to find out that you're full of it. Yeah. Um, so. Plus, and then like 
people like you, you can sense what you said. So like there are probably other people out there too or in Hollywood who can sense it. Everybody but knows. Everybody knows? Everybody knows, yeah. But it's a game I mean, that look, you have I guess to play? If you're, I guess if you're a salesperson, if you're an agent, um, but look, even if you're an agent and you're selling a client, if that client can't deliver, you know, I don't know. I mean, those are professions where the really good people don't have to lie. There's not every, the, the percentage of people who are really first rate is rather small in my experience. Really? Uh, in, in terms of producers and agents who are really, people are selling a product. You know, producers got projects or this that they're trying to raise money for and they're, you know, they, they're hustling all the time yeah. to, to get you to believe in what they're going to present to you. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? And uh, anyway... We could, this yeah, could take no, up our, the whole it conversation. It could easily. See, but this is, the, <laughs> this is the nice thing about the podcast is you don't know what conversation you're going to get into because <clears throat> right. it's kind of like if you were just to like sit down and have coffee or something, right. that's what would happen too. And it's the same in politics too. You know, like I just, uh, it's so tragic to me um, how often politicians lie and with what ease that they lie and uh, how rare it is and how special it is when people in public life um, are straight. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, look, there are compromises that we all have to make and that they all have to make, but, you know, uh, for someone to maintain their integrity and um, tell the truth is, is very difficult and uh, um, really admirable. So I, I, think, you know, I think we're sort of in a cycle right now, which is so sad that where the truth doesn't really matter Mm -hmm. it's really uh, what you can sell and if you can if you can um if you can just keep putting it out there it somehow becomes true right okay so that leads us right into oh god right this obviously leads us right into network which Mm -hmm. we're gonna we'll talk about right now but just one side thing before i forget about what you said also about your intricate stories that you made up so it also says that you have a pretty good imagination right Mm mm-hmm yeah, maybe I ended up putting those skills to good use. Yeah, but yeah, I mean that that yeah, does. Yeah, because re- I tell stories and I make up elaborate lives of the characters that I play, or if I'm directing, you know, like to, to create those kinds of characters. So, so yeah, yeah, that's I end up making See? a buck off it. <laughs> exactly. So you sublimated it in a very healthy way. Right. Do you give yourself backstories when you're acting? Yeah, you have to. You always do before yeah, you start. Very, like very important. Yeah, I did. I tend to do it. I tend to do it immediately, and then it evolves as a as I get to know a character better. Um, just talking about the actor process for a minute. Um, it used to be I always, I always loved doing it, creating biographies for characters, but it would it's a very tricky thing because um, I would get really into it, but then sometimes I, it would be an encumbrance to me because I had made all these decisions about a character that didn't necessarily have so much to do with the play or the movie that I was working on. So then I'd be doing it and going, yeah, but I decided that he was a this, that in 19, you know, 65 or whatever. But it conflicted. But it, it didn't help me at all. It kind of became this weight. So I had to learn how to be uh, fluid in my, because, uh, you know, when you're playing a character, it's constantly evolving and it's like peeling an onion. You're always trying to discover the next layer. You never, you never know. And frankly, I realize that's how life is. We think we know ourselves. We think we know where our life is going, and we're constantly yes. surprised by ourselves, by our lives, about who we are and what we represent and what we can, what we're capable of, good or bad. You know, we always try and like have a policy. This is who I am. This is what I'm about. Um, and uh, those absolutes are the things that trip us up. So, so I, I found you, you know you have to sort of include that in, in your presence. So now what I do is I more ask questions uh, as I'm reading a script. I'm like, well, what about this? Well, could be this. And then I'll go on a riff about that to myself, allowing that to maybe not. Maybe that's going to be totally different. You know. So, But it end, tends to, as you do it, uh, it tends to give you a, a real foundation um, of, uh, you know, in your imagination so that it's not a, a one-dimensional kind of, or two-dimensional thing that you're working on if that makes sense yeah so it does help up to a point there's like a sweet spot almost of being able to use that before it weighs you down it just needs to stay fluid and changeable and 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the play, Network. <laughs> so I just saw it over the weekend. I saw it on Saturday night. It was amazing. Lo I loved it. It was oh, good. so good, good. You were good. Brian Cranston good. Uh, was good. Tatiana was mm -hmm. Everybody was good. The story was like, I kept thinking, it was really um, like thought-provoking. Yeah. And I had not seen the movie. For oh, everyone really? oh, listening, okay. right, I had not seen it first. For everyone listening, this play is on Broadway now. And it is based on a movie mm -hmm. from 1976 uh, called Network. Yeah, Sidney Lumet directed it. It uh, starred um, William Holden, whose character I play, Faye Dunaway, whose character Tatiana Maslany plays, and Peter Finch, whose character, who Brian Cranston plays his character. So, um, and it won multiple, and it written, uh, most importantly, by one of our greatest writers uh, in theater, film, and television, Patty Chayefsky. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is, yeah. and, and it's directed by this extraordinary European director named Eva Van Hove, who is really a visionary um, and has completely reinvented this piece to be both completely of today, even though it's set in 1975, um, but also uh, a very, very faithful to the script that Petty Chayefsky wrote. Um, and it's quite different than the movie. And, okay, so different than the movie. I wouldn't know about that, but I do know that it is so of today, even mm -hmm. though it takes place in the 70s. So it's so interesting to watch this like metamorphosis going on like in front of your eyes of what happens to this anchor man and this uh, network. Am I describing this Yeah, properly? the basic idea of the story, which in 1976 was a satire, uh, sort of a dystopian v satire of where Patty Chayefsky saw our media culture going. Today we're living. In the 70s. We're living it exactly as he imagined it. So uh, it, it's about a guy called Howard Beale, who Brian Cranston plays. Um, Howard is sort of a grand old man of news. He's the anchor of a of a struggling network uh, that's having some trouble transitioning into sort of the modern age of of, of television. Um, and he, I play the head of the news division, um, uh, Max Schumacher. And I, at the beginning of the play, have been forced to fire my best friend, Howard Beale, because he's getting low ratings and he's kind of depressed and his wife has recently died. He's just going through a really hard time and he's being phased out for you know the modern age. And in fact, the news, the world of journalism and news as we knew it is completely changing because of money. Uh, we were of the sort of Edward R. Murrow, you know, Walter Cronkite generation of newsmen and we're becoming dinosaurs and uh, you know Coca-Cola and IBM and uh, corporate America has really taken over and pressuring uh, television you know it's about it's about getting ratings um, so Howard goes on television not to give too much away uh, and says he's going to commit suicide Right, he says that on live TV. Live TV, he's like, next week I will be killing myself on television, and it creates a, you know, a catastrophe in the network. But the ratings go through the roof, and these, um, you know, the people that are the corporate heads realize they have a tiger by the tail, and um, they want more of it. And uh, it really is about a man who starts to lose his mind, uh, very, very publicly. And I'm trying to save him, and the network is trying to make a buck off of him. And um, it's uh, sort of like the precursor of what reality television became mm -hmm. with Jerry Springer and Morton Downey Jr., and then now Fox News, and, you know, yeah. all of it. All now. of it, right. Mm -hmm. and, and really Donald Trump, you know, what the, what, uh, 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 you know, what, what has landed I mean, you know, with a celebrity in the White House um, and how they really harness, knows how to manipulate yeah. the news media to his um, advantage and to message and to spin stuff, uh, uh, you know, that may or may not be true, and it kind of doesn't matter, right? And manipulate people mm -hmm. into a powerful force um, behind him, which is interesting. You see in the play too that even I don't want to give it away, but it's so interesting to see all the different people get sucked into this new way of being on TV, which yeah. could be like Trump, it could be what I don't want to keep you know going down the names. Yeah, of I mean, it sort of started be, in the '90s with you know reality TV with shock jock. Yeah, you know, so is, so is like oh, I think interesting. Morton yes. Downey Jr. If people remember, 
kind of to me was the first one who like started had a show like that which was just um throwing firebombs and getting rid and then jerry springer and you know Geraldo rivera started doing it who was a more legit journalist who then you know yeah, got, yeah. Went, went on, that, went went on the fringes yeah. you know and then on the conserv you know the, he's very conservative but you know rush limbaugh and what's his name uh the other uh super, you know conservative uh, uh radio host um Oh my God, I'm blanking on his name. But you know, or, or so much of Fox News, what they did of really, um, you know, news as entertainment and to fire up, right, to fire people um, up, people's anger and outrage to and get more uh, to get leverage, leverage and ratings, and yeah. you know, ultimately tremendous, tremendous power. So it was funny. I had just watched, I think, two nights before. Do you know talk radio? It was a play. The Eric Bogosian play, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I interviewed Eric on Friday, last Friday. Oh, yeah. So on Eric's Thursday awesome. night, yeah, he's awesome. I uh, On Thursday night, I watched talk radio. That's really good. The movie or the, yeah, the Alec Baldwin? The movie. Baldwin. Alec yeah. Baldwin. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Eric was the lead. Mm-hmm. Oliver and it was Oliver Stone. Stone right. So yeah. he had, so Eric had been nominated for a Pulitzer for the play, right. for writing it. And he was in the play as well, the first run. Yeah. And then Oliver Stone wanted to make a movie from it. Mm-hmm. So he did, or out of it. And so I was watching that movie the night before, and without giving too much away, there were so many parallels. It was so interesting. And that film was from the 80s, yeah. and then here this is. And it's like both were so, not only similar, but relevant today, mm-hmm. so it's Yeah, no, Eric's a genius, he really is. And yeah. now, uh, okay, so you and Brian Cranston also, mm-hmm. you can see on stage, you seem to have a real chemistry. Oh, that's nice to hear. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Like you play, you play old friends, yeah, we're, we're, not just colleagues, yeah. but friends. And I could sense that for sure on stage. You guys knew each other ahead mm-hmm. of time, right? Yeah, Brian and I met 21 years ago. Lots we uh, did uh, a mini series for HBO uh, called From Earth to the Moon, which uh, Tom Hanks and Ron Howard produced, and it was about the Apollo space program. And um, uh, I played Neil Armstrong, and Brian played Buzz Aldrin. And so uh, one of the episodes was all about the Apollo 11 mission. So Brian and I spent a lot of time together um, in a spaceship and, and became friends. And I remembered doing that during that show. This was preceded Malcolm in the Middle. And uh, the thing Brian was best known for at that point, you know, he'd, he'd worked, he had a whole career. He was in his, I think, early to mid 40s. Um, and was, you know, everyone thought he was a really good actor, but he's best known for playing the dentist in Seinfeld. Right. And he was hilarious in that. But he's Tim not, Wally, right? His career, had, yeah, Dr. Tim. And it, but his career had not broken out. And as I got to know him, I remembered saying to myself, this guy's a genius, and no one knows it. Like, he was, he is, if you get to know Brian, he's one of the funniest people you'll ever meet. He just has this crazy eccentric sense of humor, and he can do impressions of the weirdest people to have you on the floor laughing. Uh, and in, in anything I'd seen him, and I'd never seen that. I mean, he was always really good, you know? And then, and he's quite a brilliant man too. And I, I part of me was like, oh my God, look at Brian's what, 42, 44. And I, I just felt so frustrated. I thought, God, man, it's just this business is so crazy that someone can be this gifted. And, and then all of a sudden, a year or two later, he's in Malcolm in the Middle. Right, which still was wasn't like, even. Yeah. I was like, yes, look at, because he's genius in that. Did you ever watch that? I mean, I have never oh, seen Malcolm in the Middle, not even one scene. It's so good. Okay. It's, it's for a younger audience, but he and Jane Kaczmarek play the parents of these kids, and he's this browbeaten husband, and he's hilariously funny. I mean, he, he just the stuff he does in that. It's it's a really well written, clever I'll check show. It out. I highly recommend okay. it. Okay, uh, I'm sure it's on Netflix. Know, or he something. and Jane are both brilliant in it. Yeah, but if you knew you watch it, a couple of episodes, what Brian does is just amazing in it. So, so you were I was like, so yes. happy for him, and his show was a big success, and I think ran for several years, and. And then Walter White comes around and like transforms television as we know it. Seriously, and he becomes one of our greatest actors. You know, like uh, so. Anyway, so uh, I've just like been so happy for him, and um, you know, to see that happen for somebody who I, I, uh, I just regard so highly, and and I was so fond of. You know, and he's and he's also the dearest, most down to earth, kind human being. Um, he and his wife Robin are both like that. So, so anyway, it was all great, you right. know. And, and then we saw each other over the years, and I was always just so happy for him. And and then um, 
Yeah, then this happens. So okay, so, so it's back a great on the reunion. Mm -hmm. So this is a good, a good reunion. But like, so you were frustrated. Like, why is he forty two and so obviously amazing? Do you think that happens like a lot? Yeah. Why? Hmm. Let me just say there are few people as gifted as Brian Cranston. So it doesn't happen but it's a lot. Not a, but it's not a totally out there story that somebody no, as gifted as No, there are many, many people that I've known over the years. Look, actors need parts. And, um, you know, it's the, it's the sucky thing about being an actor. You know, you, you can't do your thing unless someone provides you with the opportunity or you create it for yourself. Sylvester Stallone created yeah, Rocky for yeah, himself, yeah. you know? Brilliant um, to do that. Good move. And a lot of people have done that. You know, they're like, I'm, and that's kind of what it takes. You got you, you to gotta have a kind of persistence to, you know, to, to, to prevail in this business unless you just get super lucky. Mm -hmm. um, and um, look, and Brian worked his butt off and he was persistent and, you know, luck... In many ways, as they say, is you know, is uh, is is where opportunity meets preparation. So he was prepared, mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. the opportunity presented itself to him. You know, and over the years, also, what happens to someone like Brian is you get, I, and I see this all the time. Everyone goes, "Yeah, he's great. He's great." You know, in the business, people are like, "Oh, he's you can count on Brian. He's you know, he's great." The amount of people in my career who have said to me, oh, "You're so underrated," you know, like. I, I once had an agent say to me, you're one of the most underrated actors. And it makes me so mad. You're one of the most underrated actors in Hollywood. And I was like, well, dude, do something <laughs> right, about right. it. It's good that you, you know, recognize like, it. You're the only person in the no, position. No, but I got depressed. I was. I remember being in my like, early 30s and I was in a movie. And he was like, you know, it makes me so mad. You know, you're so good. You're just the most under. And I, I was like, help. Right. But, but, so, but after a while, you know, as an actor who I worked with early in my career once said, you know, cream tends to rise. Yeah. So the really wonderful actors, people start to know about it, but they need the opportunities. Yeah, and yeah. so... And how do they get the opportunities? There then? are, you know, some they fight, fight for them. Mostly that's it. I gotta say, really? you just gotta keep fighting. Because I also know many, many, many brilliant actors who don't have that skill of just putting themselves out there and scrapping for stuff. Uh. And they tend to not get the shots. It's um, unless they get lucky and someone just gives them the part and everyone and they win an award or they get celebrated and that and that does happen. Yeah. But it's that's that's much harder, you uh -huh. know. And, and if that can break your heart because you see, being an artist, you know, you really are so vulnerable and ugh, you know you got to develop a thick skin and you get attacked and criticized and um, rejected constantly. And so it's. And we're by by definition sensitive creatures. Yeah. So it it's it's one of the things that's very hard about it. You know, I mean, there are painters. Um, my stepfather was a painter, and um, he you know he suffered from depression. And I know there were decades when my stepfather John, who I thought was quite a wonderful painter, would never show his work to anyone. He was quite celebrated in his early career, and then he got freaked out and he refused to show anybody his work he'd Nobody? go to his studio and paint every day but he wouldn't show his work and he'd have like gallery owners going we want to come by and look and he'd set up these studio uh, visits with like Gagosian and major galleries and then he'd cancel at the last minute because he couldn't bear the rejection he couldn't bear to be judged and have his work judged by somebody else in a mercantile way and and as a result he I don't mean to be depressing but he died in obscurity you know yeah and yeah. um uh I was like, whoa. And that's, I do know some, you know, actors tend to be show offs, so it's maybe not as common for an actor, but it is, um, I do know people who, who um, don't have that muscle and, and um, they're not, they don't get the attention that they deserve. Right. It's almost like we were talking about before how like you know, to, not to bring myself into, but with the podcast, you this is my thing is talking and like getting to know people. But there are the business sides of it, like because it's my podcast, I have to think about those things. Right. It's the same thing with acting. Like you're acting, you need other muscles to build yeah, as man, well. I, if anybody's listening to this who wants to get into this game, you have to be. You, as a friend of mine put it early on, and you have to be the president of your own company because it is a business, mm -hmm. and while. If you have not developed your creative skills, and y then you're nowhere. That gets to the bullshit thing we were talking about at the beginning. It, you know, the hustle. If you got nothing to hustle, you're wasting your time hustling. 
But if you've if you've put you know ninety five percent of your attention on developing yourself as an artist and you have something to say and you have something to offer, then you that other five percent you got to double down on it. Right. Because um. So you need both too. You, you really need, need, you both, need both, or else you it's really going to be really tough. Yeah, and and it's hard to develop those skills. It took me a very long time uh, to understand that. It took me. Yeah, a long time. Did I was you super almost quit? Pers- I, uh, I did not. I di- I never almost quit. I had m- multiple times um, where I thought it would never work out in my twenties, where I literally was in despair, thinking this is just never going to happen, um, or doubting whether I had the capability to do it. I got um, some, you know, I'm, uh, uh, I got some incredibly the most valuable advice I've ever received um, at nineteen years old. Uh, my brother-in-law was a very famous jazz musician and uh, it was at a moment I was in college and I was like desperate to be an actor and certain that that's what I wanted to do but had no idea how to go about it or if I had the goods and um, I was sort of complaining to Gary one day (laughs) and I was like how do you know and I don't know and you know like and he was like look when I was your age I felt exactly the same as you um, and he said, and Tony, I was a kid from a small town in Indiana who was a child prodigy, but I had no idea if I could be a professional musician. And I came to New York and I said to myself, if I commit to this thing that I'm so passionate about, 100%, one of three things will happen. Um, or one of two things will happen. I don't know. We'll count after I say this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, either my path will be exactly what I imagine and I'll become what I see and I'll be successful at it or it will lead me to something else that I have no idea about that I'm supposed to be doing Um, you know but uh, I guess or the third thing is it'll all go up in flames and it won't work (laughs) but I won't be the guy who at 40 or 50 years old looks back at his life and says oh gee maybe I could have if I'd only tried Mm -hmm. he said you don't want to be that guy that's good advice. And I was like, oh my God, that's the greatest advice ever. So many times during my early career when I was rejected or I just couldn't get traction or, you know, I had months out of work um, or, you know, I, where I thought I, it just is not happening. I was like, well, I made a commitment to this and I'm going to keep com- doing it 100% because I, no, I didn't know what else to do. But also, I made a commitment to do this. And until something else reveals itself, I'm just going to keep going. Uh, so that's that, that, pulled, you that pulled me through. Uh-huh. Um, and I've shared that advice with a lot of people because uh, um, it still is the most valuable thing. But it's so interesting to think that like people who see you on Scandal, let's say, like that you actually had that experience years ago where like you couldn't, you felt like you weren't even going to get a job. You like couldn't, you would do an audition and you wouldn't get a job. Oh so, my God, the number of people who told me, hang it up. Oh, really? Told you to many, hang it up? Many, Yeah. Oh, like God. who? Jesus, so many. My, uh, my, the, the, my first real acting teacher, who is to this day the best acting teacher I've ever had, who was the teacher um, at Brandeis University where I went to college. Uh, and, you know, luckily I, this guy was teaching there when I was there. But he was a real cranky... <laughs> <laughs> gruff scary dude and when I got to Brandeis I was in his acting class I transferred there as a junior filled with ambition to be an actor like it was the same age as that year when I met Gary I was 19 and like I'm gonna do this and I Brandeis had quite a serious theater department and it was a very good school academically so I was like okay I'm gonna go there and I'm gonna I went there to try and you know and I got into Ted's class and he just was not impressed with me at all and um he was very rough on me and uh oh god he said the meanest thing to me so and i did not get i did not get cast in anything there like in my early the first school i went to hamilton college i got there and i immediately got the lead in the first play and i was like oh this is easy like i (laughs) did a lot there was this tiny school and and i got to brenda's and i auditioned for everything got cast in nothing Nothing. and then literally i was i felt like i was stinking up the room every time i went i was like what is happening and I was in Ted's class, and I was terrified, and he just was not. So I guess this uh, ambition thing revealed itself to me because I was like, well, it's not happening here, so screw them. I'm going to 
get a job in Boston. I'm going to see what else I can do. So I went through the local papers for auditions and uh, saw, and I'd been there like six months into the school year, like the winter time, and I flopped. So I went in and I saw that there was auditions for this thing called the Boston Shakespeare Company, which was a semi-professional Shakespeare company, which means it wasn't a union company, but there were adult actors and they did, they had a budget and they did full productions of, of classical sh- works and they were auditioning for Richard the Third, the Shakespeare play. So I went in, it's like, I'm going to go audition for this. So I went and auditioned and I got cast nice. as the Duke of Clarence, which is a really good part in, in Richard the Third. I couldn't believe I got cast. Okay. So I was beside myself with excitement. So I go to Ted, who was head of the theater department in addition to my acting teacher. And I said, uh, Ted, I just wanted to let you know, you know, I, I got this opportunity and is it okay that I, I want to make sure it's okay that I do this. And he sits in my eyes office and he goes, um, well, well, that's great. That's great. That's great. Um, I, I, I just hope you understand why they cast you. Oh boy. I was like, what? He's like, I just think you need, like, you know why they cast you in the, in the part. And I was like, Whoa, what? He said, well, your last name, Goldwyn. You know, and for people that don't know, my grandfather was a famous movie producer. I have a famous last name, right? I'm from a Hollywood family. So he said, you got the part because your name's Goldwyn. And oh, that's why that's why they man. hired you. And I almost burst into tears. Oh. <laughs> and I was like, um, oh, well, uh, I don't know. Well, uh, if that's true, I, 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 I still think it's a good opportunity for me and I, I'm going to do it, you know, because I'm going to just... And I was, I was bright red and he was like, no, 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 you should. That's great. You should, that's good. You should do it. That is so mean. It was so hurtful. That is so But rude. I was like, all right, well, maybe that's true, but that doesn't mean I want to be an actor any less, so I'm still going to try. <laughs> so I went and, and did it. Okay, so I did this show, which... um. I think I think the production was probably terrible. <laughs> but I got to do, do you know, Wait, why do you think? I just laugh because the Boston Shakespeare Company, the Boston Globe hated oh. this theater company. So every show that we did, you know, got just trashed in the paper. But it did that did not matter. I got to do it. Um uh you know, there were it was a great experience yeah. for me. One of my other castmates in that show is the great actor Courtney B. Vance. Get out of Courtney here. Courtney was at Harvard as an undergraduate, and he did the same thing I did. So we were in this together, and that's how we became friends. Oh, that is cool. And so, you know, right? Good for us. Yes. And I was, I probably, for a 20 year old or whatever, I just, just turned 20 by the time I was almost 20, I did okay. Like I got through. And um, I'll never forget this. My class came to see me in the show. Your class. Ted, my teacher, Ted brought, brought the, class? the class. Like, let's go support what? Tony, and you know, and see, see him in the show. And I'll, and his face after seeing me in the show was kind of like that wasn't yeah. bad. Like that was that wasn't. I remember just the look on his face. He was surprised that I was did okay. And um, <clears throat> and I had sort of by being hurt that way. I was like, fuck him. I don't give a shit. I'm doing this. I don't need him. You know, I wanted so desperately his approval before. And then when he said that to me, I was like, well, screw you. I'm, I'm with or without you. I'm going to pursue this thing. And then the look on his face when they came back to, so I was pleased that they came to kind of support me. And, and, um, and I could just see on his face that he was surprised. And I was like, mm-hmm. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so I was a junior in college. This was at the, by the end, this was like the spring of that year. So at the end of, that was the end of the year. And, um, they he had auditions and he cast me in the lead of the show that he was directing for the fall play of my senior year in college. Whoa, what a switcheroo. And so then I became like the leading actor ah. or whatever. I think I got like three or d- leads in the next year. And it was just like, I was like, oh, okay, that's how it works. You just don't, you know, you can't, and you know, I, I go on length about that story because that just replicated itself so many times in my really? career. Oh my God. I had a, an agent once um, who said to me, you know, after I'd started working a bit, had not yet done Ghost, which was my first big break, but I, I was wor- a working actor and struggling though, but trying to get, getting jobs, but still feeling like um, I was sucking traction. wind, you know, uh-huh. not getting traction. And um, I felt that I needed a better, bigger agent. So I got this agency was going to sign me and I needed to have a meeting with the, the head of the agency. Right. And she was in LA. So I go out to LA and I, and I kept, kept trying to schedule this meeting. Right. 
And the New York agents were like, no, 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 we really want you, and she's got to meet you, and but but it's all great, and we've told her we love you, and and I'm calling, and she's not returning my calls, and I keep persistently calling her. I finally get this woman on the phone, and she's like, oh yes, uh, uh, what's your name again? I said Tony Goldwyn. She's like, oh yes, you know, I just honestly, I looked at your tape because you have a demo reel of like scenes from stuff that you've done. I looked at your tape, and frankly, I just didn't see much there. Uh, and I was like, uh, oh, uh, oh, okay. Yes, goodbye, and she hung up the phone on me. And I thought, what? <laughs> like, I've been told that she, I thought she was going to sign me. I thought she, they wanted me. And she said this to me, and I was at that point 28 or 20, 28, 28, 29 years. Like right before I got, no, 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 no it was 20, 27 or 28, uh, about a year before I got ghost. Um, and, um, but that was incredibly but like, painful. Painful. You know? I'm like, why did everybody make you, lead you why, to leave here? Yeah, your- so it's so similar. Those kinds of things happen, and yeah. you just go, well, okay. Yeah. And then you just chuck on, you know, and that's, um, that's happened to me a lot in different ways, whether it, you know, as, as I got bigger in bigger things, uh, the critic from the New York Times giving you a shitty review, and you're like, Oh, or for what? Fi- um, well, I got uh, Frank Rich. I remember giving me it wasn't well, that bad a review, but I had had a big success in a play in New York um, in 1990. Uh, I won an Obie Award, and I was like every I got all these rave reviews, and it, it was at the same year that Ghost came out, which was my first big part in the movie. My career really yeah, took loved off, right? Ghost, by the way. And um, so I was sort of for a moment hot, and because uh, several times in my career I've been hot and not hot, hot and not hot, and you get used to that cycle. Um, but at that time, that was my first experience of it, and I was like, "Oh my God!" Just like being, at, you know, in a rocket ship. And um, the next play I did, Frank Rich didn't. Who was the New York Times yeah. critic? Didn't like it, uh, and was rather dismissive of me uh, in the play. Uh, <laughs> my dear father, I learned I don't read reviews. I've learned not to read reviews because it just can't help you whether they're good or bad. It's just. It's irrelevant to it. It can only mess you up. So I sort of learned, like, I was still drawn to read them, but I was at this point, I was like, don't read the reviews, don't read the reviews. And my father calls me up the morning the play op- after the play opened. He's like, you okay? Oh, no. <laughs> my pop, I don't read the reviews. He's like, oh, well, I just want you to know I'm on your team, you know? I don't get whatever oh. the New York Times says doesn't matter. <laughs> Like, New York Times really, that rag. Really? You <laughs> right. had to say that? So <laughs> I'd go out and read the kind of oh, no. Or, um, I don't know. There was a great new critic, a uh, great, uh, he was awful, but the critic for the New York Times, a famous critic, or New York Magazine, John Simon, in the, well, from the mm. 60s and 70s through, but in the 90s when I was working, you know, starting to work all the time. And I was in a play on Broadway, which was wonderful, and we got great reviews. Mm-hmm. And I thought, and again, I, by that time, I was mid thirties. I was like, I don't care. I don't yeah. read them. So, which is my policy now. But I had two friends come and uh, see the show, and they were completely civilians. Like they were in, you know, finance or something. They're like, civilians. Well, oh, we yeah. loved it so much, and we're going. to But how do you feel about reviews? Like, I was like, well, I don't read them yet. But like, what about when you get a bad one? I was like, oh well, I just don't look at them, so I don't. They don't. But I mean, like the one in New York Magazine, what they said about you. Like, <laughs> oh, how did you? No. How do you deal with that? <laughs> I was like, well, I don't know. I didn't read it. So then, of course, yeah, I had to go and look at it. Too. So by that time, I had enough of a sense of humor to... Uh, like, let it to, roll to, a to, bit. You know, he just said I was miscast or something. It wasn't that bad. But but um, anyway. But that could knock know. anybody. Like, any of one of those examples could Oh, yeah. I mean, look, network's going to open this week, and I will not be reading the reviews. Because right. I, I also have read good reviews of myself, and then you were very aware of that. You know, one, my best friend who I is an, an actor and a writer, and he, uh, I always have him come and look at my work when I'm in a play. And, and uh, the one I referred to back in 1990, The Sum of Us, it was called, it was this beautiful Australian play that I, was, you know, a big hit and stuff. And, and uh, we got a great review in the New York Times, which I studied. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you, you studied <laughs> you know? it. But. And this is before I learned my lesson. And he, uh, he was like, Tony, your work's great, but you're playing the review. I was like, what? He said that thing that they said uh, in the New York Times about you, you're like doing that. So that's like settled he into your brain. He said something about my physicality or something. And he was like, man, you're really doing that. And I was like, oh, that that's what I'm so aware of. What, oh, they like this bit. So you can't. Yeah, 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 you can't. So you learned you just can't even look. Unless somebody says something about, about it. And I still would to. not. No, no. Now I would not. No, because 
there's nothing to be gained. It really, you, people's opinions are their opinions and you cannot let it right. influence your work. You know, and I've gotten bad reviews as a movie director. I've gotten great reviews and bad reviews and it's painful. You know, as a, as a director, it's a little different because you're done and it won't affect your work, but um, I don't know. Yeah. Um, okay. Someone's going to like you, someone's going to hate you. That's just the reality. That is always going to happen no matter what. Right. So you can't go, you can't ride There's always those one waves. bad one. So, you know, even in your greatest yeah. performance. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, if the bad one's the New York Times, it's, That's a, it's, bummer. it's a bummer in the theater because they have so much power. But So I always feel like when I get a good review, I just dodged a bullet. That's how I feel. I'm like, thank right. you. Okay. We got lucky this time. And then move on. I suspect the reviews here are going to be good. I suspect they will be, but mm -hmm. I won't be reading them. And there will be there, one, already, there will be some bad ones. Right. I mean, there were people, there was already, you know, like I like to ask people questions or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I was even asking the, uh, like one of the ushers or whatever, like, how's it going over here? You know, how's everything? And and she was just like, oh, people are loving this. So you know, I don't know do if I should have told you this, though. Because that might make you. No, no, no. I can, oh, look, okay. the audience loves it. I know. And people okay. who see right, it, audience. they're the ones to me that matter. Yep. And someone might not. You know, I've had multiple people go, oh, yeah, I love this, but I didn't like that part, and this didn't make sense to me, or I like this performance better than that performance. Fine, that's, we're all entitled to right. that, to our experience of it. It's when it's sort of put out there publicly, and you are the authority for thousands of people yeah. who might potentially be forming an opinion. You can always tell on an opening, the day after opening, if you've gotten good reviews or not, because an audience in previews might be like cheering and if at the day after opening they're suddenly quiet, you're like, ooh, I think the New York Times probably don't like us. That's terrible, because that influences then, their, their experience influence their of experience, it. Yeah. Even if, not only does it stop them from going to get tickets, but that actually influences the way that they receive Yeah, or I've also had the opposite, where like perception was a little, you know, m muted in previews, and then all of a sudden after opening night, they're like, Wah! cheering and standing That's ovations so like interesting. oh well the new york times must have liked us because uh there's people are now feeling enfranchised too isn't that interesting yeah people are you know that's the way of influenced the world. yeah yeah which also kind of reminds me a little bit of network too but mm -hmm. in a different way but it's like it just shows you that like one authority figure saying something right. can really influence the way that people sure. see a situation yeah we're all I'm, I'm guilty of it myself all right so let's go to a few of the things that you <clears throat> have directed so dexter mm -hmm. is one of them mm -hmm personal favorite love Dexter I love that show. Great show that was yeah. a good show and that was like earlier that was one of the early of like that type of show wasn't mm -hmm. it it was yeah really groundbreaking yeah um, so you directed a bunch of episodes yeah right? my brother um, was the producer of Dexter my brother John who's a wonderful film intelligent producer and he, he um, and a, a colleague of his uh, found the book and developed it at Showtime and so um, and so he said would you direct one and I was like yeah and then I came in and did a bunch of them and I played a part on it and it was- That it was is cool. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I just thought of something else that you said before. So, um, what was his name, Tim, the drama teacher? Ted. Ted, okay. Ted Kaznoff. So Ted, is it possible that Ted was kind of um, impacted by your last name too, but in a negative way? Like, you know how he mm, said that- Maybe that he that, prejudged me? Yeah. Probably, yeah. In a negative, like it was like, oh, he's a, just a gold win yeah. or whatever, so he I just think feels entitled or something. probably likely. So do you come upon that too along the way? Yeah. Um, because you're, just to clarify, I, so your grandfather My grandfather was, was a very Samuel famous Goldwyn. movie producer named Samuel Goldwyn, who was really one of the founders of the movie business. The whole um, industry. Yeah, he literally you know, produced the first feature length film ever made in, in, Los, in Hollywood um, and many shorts in New York before then, like in 1912, 1914, the came out, and won an Oscar for, went on to you know win an Oscar for Best Picture in 1946 with The Best Years of Our Lives and produced many classic films and um, you know he made his last movie the year before I was born in 1959 which was Porgy and Bess um, so his career spanned from 1912 I think to 1959 he was really a, a giant and an extraordinary human being so anyway yeah that was my grandpa and he yeah. started the company that became MGM so his name you know was always attached to that even though he never was a part of MGM he had his own he was an independent oh, producer but okay but yeah but he's he's uh yeah but you would think that it might be easier for you to get a gig or get respect because of it it's both it's both but it's also a two-edged sword look you get you get contact the way I, my experience of it was I think there were plenty of people that would judge me I always knew that was kind of after that thing had happened with Ted I was like you know what that's their problem it was more my personal hang up 
that I had to decide for myself or prove to myself that I had the goods. Right. So it troubled me a lot until, really until I was in my 30s, like till Ghost and then after I'd done a few things where I really started to build a reputation of doing quality work myself. Then I was like, all right, I've earned my stripes. Yeah. Up until then, I didn't want people thinking I'd gotten this because of my family, but I figured they probably thought that. Right. You, know, well, you can't realize, land either it anyway, matter. no matter what. You know, it, it really doesn't matter. And, and what I discovered, I felt honestly in my 20s, it felt like more of, a, it felt like more of a, uh, an obstacle because people prejudged me or they were like, eh. Yeah. It was hard for people to take you seriously because they're like, oh, you're a Hollywood kid. You know, once I'd made my bones a bit, it became an advantage. Because uh, particularly when I, you know, had multiple different successes and became a director, people were like, "Wow, that's so cool! You're like part of a legacy. Like, isn't that so interesting?" And and then it's become so. For the past twenty years or whatever, for me, it's been a beautiful thing to be a part of. Yeah. And uh, I feel very privileged. Uh, you know, my brothers are both, and two of two of my three brothers. Uh, I have two other sisters as well, but my two of my brothers are in the business. My, you know, and. Um, it's something we share. Our kids are in are forming a fourth generation. What are your kids doing in the business? You have two My daughters, older right? daughter is a writer and is a television writer and wrote her. You know, she used to, she wrote until recently on the show Supergirl was her first job, which oh. was a hit. And she's mm-hmm. doing other things. My younger daughter is just starting out as an actress. My niece, my brother John's daughter, is a writer and performer. Um, she wrote on the show Smilf. Uh, and she's in this company, Groundlings, in Los Angeles, this improv company. And Emily is super talented and is on an, another show, I think, for is huge, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this is, it's an incredibly beautiful, I try to, you know, pass on to my kids that it's like a beautiful thing to be a part of, but you just got to earn your own, figure out how you fit into it and contribute your own thing to it. And it's like, so in a way, it's become a family business, you know. Um, but it's not a normal family business. It's not like, this is the company and you're going to get a job and come into the family business. And yeah. it doesn't work that way, unfortunately. Right. So it's not like that nepotism, or like that beautiful it. advantage or whatever. No, you meet people so you have access and uh-huh. you inherit a lot of knowledge by osmosis. You know, like the greatest thing I, I learned, you know, the greatest thing I, I got from my family, of being part of my fam- a family business was the understanding that it's about building a long-term career and about surviving to be my age and still in the game, as opposed to what we're led to believe that being hot and being on the cover of a magazine and being, you know, the, like the, the flavor guy. of the it guy, that that's the thing. You know, our culture, our pop culture tells us that's what you want to be. Uh-huh. And that's not the point. Right. You know, because some people are that and they flame out, flame out in five minutes. And some people have very long sustained career where they build a body of work, even if though they they might have been the it guy at various points or not in their career. Um, the point is to build a foundation and a, something that you just can constantly build on, so that you know I want to, I'd like to die on my feet, yeah. you know, doing what I like to do. Well, it looks like you're totally on track to do that now. I mean, it's been yeah, years. You've, you've done a million things yeah. now, mm-hmm. good, solid things in all yeah, different areas. Well, of course, some I'm it has super to be. proud of. Some not. Some I'm like, right, oh you, no, what? you saw that. How did you find that? <laughs> Someone came up to me about a movie that I made. Oh my god, the worst. So I've made some Which real one? pieces of crap because I had to make a living, you know, and um, or I thought something might be good and it turned to be a disaster, you know. And then those are the things that do not go away. And you're like, oh my god. Um, so, um, like and what? other things like that what? I, to, somebody's gonna want to look something up now. I what don't is want it? them to. They can go through my MDV and go, "What is that?" <laughs> right. <laughs> but, um, that may be it. Um, but things, other things that I'm super proud of that I thought were brilliant and like, didn't get a shot, like a film I did um, that, that was such a beautiful movie called uh, "The Substance of Fire," that was based on a wonderful uh, John Robin Bates play. Um, that you know it was was did fine, but I feel like should have gotten more exposure than it did. Uh, I, but you know many of those okay. um, a beautiful film called An American Rhapsody that I did with Scarlett Johansson and Nastasia Kinski 20 years ago not quite 20 years ago but that was beautiful lots of small films that I've done that just haven't you know 
Yeah, it's almost like um, the Brian Cranston thing, like you were saying before. Yeah. Like they're they're great yeah. and they're amazing, mm-hmm. and but they don't necessarily get pulled into the right. stratosphere. Yeah, or, or they whatever. don't find an audience, or yeah, it's not yeah. their moment, or whatever. Uh-huh, you know. uh-huh. But it doesn't mean that they're not good. Yeah. Um, okay, so we have limited time, mm-hmm. and I have a million other things to talk to you about. So I have to kind of pick and choose right now what some of my things are. But I want to know about your wife, your wife mm-hmm. Jane. You've been mm-hmm. married a long time. Yep. You wrote one of the things that you wrote. We started talking about you being a writer. Was for more magazine which i think is now defunct right sorry to say but i can't find the full article anyway i only got the first page yeah what you was were that walking, about you were writing about three that was a while generations ago. oh yeah of that was women. an interesting article i wrote about i've written a bunch of stuff about women and about uh, certainly i wrote something recently for in style about the, yes i read the that me one. too movement which from, was good everyone should read that too it okay, was interesting yeah. about when it's about the man's sort of the Me Too mm-hmm. men's movement <laughs> that's mm-hmm. come up. But the thing in War Magazine a few years ago, I wrote about uh, feminism, sort of, about my perspective on three generations of women and my mother, who was a very gifted woman, but who really um, didn't achieve her potential professionally, I felt, because she was part of a generation where she felt the need to sublimate her professional identity to that of her husband, husbands, plural, my dad and then my stepfather. Um, and uh you know and yet my wife jane who came of age in the 70s really and was really part of the first gener- broad generation of women who really um you know a- a- achieved their potential uh but still very much in a man's world and had it was a it was a fight um and uh now i have two daughters who are in their 20s who view it as their birthright like they don't even question that they should be successful and yet they still now since that article because at that age i think tess was probably still in college and yeah, I think anna so, was yeah. just maybe just out of college or maybe i can't remember when i wrote that but it was they were just kind of i think it's a college age kids yeah, yeah. And then they were both college age kids and maybe anna was in grad school or something but they hadn't yet faced the world and now that they both are you know, uh, and particularly with the events of the last year in the Me Too movement, um, you know, coming up against still the intransigence of a, the challenges of, of a male dominated society. And obviously in the last year, it's all blown wide open. Mm-hmm. But uh, that was a piece where I just kind of looked at um, very those reflective. three generations You're a and how person. I saw that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Reflective, analytical in your head. Kind all of, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and that's what helps you do what you do so well, I think. Right, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's a good thing. Yeah, it's, but nece- sometimes a it's probably, thing. a necessary but, thing. But it's probably, there's a, probably a, a downside of it. No. No? Well, the downside of it, I don't find it a downside now. Uh, as a younger man, um, being introspective can become navel-gazing in a way that's not terribly productive. Okay. And actors tend to be quite narcissistic anyway. So frankly, until I had children... It was not a great thing because I'd spent a lot of my time thinking about myself and my place in the world, and that was not helpful. Once you have kids, they're kind of like, get over yourself. It's all about me. Yes. And that was very good for me. Yes. And I do have a wife who um, reinforced that. <laughs> As all good <laughs> view wives of the do. World. So uh, I'm very appreciative to Jane, who was kind of like, get over yourself. Uh huh. When I'd be like acting so hard, I you know blah, blah, whatever. Right, right, yeah. right. But you need that, right? Exactly, you yes, need that to kind of very, offset. It. Very, very lucky for the women in my life. One of my last questions I always like to finish with is a two-parter. Number one is who do people assume you are? Like, what's the image they have of Tony Goldwyn? I don't know, hundred percent. I'm always surprised by the comment I get very often when I work with people is, "You're such a nice guy. Like, you're so normal. You're so down to earth." I, I'm so surprised by that, and I think, or you're so humble. And I'm like, wh- what did you expect? I don't know what people expect. I don't know if because I am from a Hollywood family that people think I'll be an arrogant prick, or just because I've had some success that I will be that. Right. I don't know, uh, but I. So I don't know, but people seem to have this like reaction to me of like surprise that I'm like a decent human being. Right. Maybe it could so, be because you've had success. But no, I don't think that would really... I don't know. Maybe it's a combination of both. Yeah. Uh, or like maybe they see they think you from Ghost or something. Famous last or maybe that's it too, that they that I played villainous characters, so they expect me to be 
a scumbag. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Which clearly you aren't. I know, honestly, I'm not. I'm not that I'm, you know, I'm, we're none of us perfect, but uh, yeah. So who are you in reality? I'm still figuring that out. Good answer. We'll get back to you on my deathbed. <laughs> <laughs> you think you'll have it figured out by then? Well, that's just all I got by that point. <laughs> that's, uh, I love full information. Hold on, don't press stop just yet. Tony and I recorded a short video with quick answer questions, and it's super fun. We talk about his pet peeves, what cracks him up, his guilty pleasures, bad advice he got from his agents, and a gig that got away, thoughts on his TV shows and movies, and so much more. We laugh a lot. It's available now on my YouTube channel. Just open up YouTube and search for Really Famous. In the meantime, if you like Really Famous, it would be fabulous if you want to rate it on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening. Just tap on the number of stars you think it deserves. And if you're a writer like Tony, hey, go ahead, craft a few words for a review. Moving on, I have big news. I now have merch. Yes, merchandise, really famous things like t-shirts, dog bandanas, mugs, fun stuff with the Really Famous logo on them. You can score your Really Famous merch right now at reallyfamouspodcast.com. If you get something, please snap a picture of yourself and send it to me. I'll post it on social media. That would be super fun. My email is reallyfamouspodcast at gmail.com. If you do email me and you send me a picture, I won't ignore you. I promise. Speaking of pet peeves, which Tony and I did, I can't stand it when people flake on email. That's one of my pet peeves, so I try really hard not to be an offender. So anyway, to recap, catch Tony's spectacular video right now by subscribing to my Really Famous YouTube channel. And check out my merch on reallyfamouspodcast.com. I'm Kara Mayer-Robinson. Thanks for listening. We talked about this in the full podcast, which you can listen to right now, and you should because... Because it's really cool. We had a great conversation. You should go listen to the podcast. On any podcast app. Um, okay, On what, any podcast app. Okay. What, what crack? Listen to Kara. You can't see her, but listen to her. What she says is very true. <laughs> That's right. <laughs>